Hi. Uh, how did we like this year's Scala, um, Scala Days? All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to take an opportunity to thank everybody for a wonderful conference. This has been amazing so far. Uh, and I'm honored to be on stage here to promote the community through a cool thing that we have called the Phil Bagwell Memorial Scala Community Award. Um, so what is this? This is an award that we try to give to individuals that we think have made a significant uh, contribution to the community, to building the community we want to have, right? This, uh, this, this, is, this is on the website. You can see the, the link there um, for what this award is, what it means. But we're looking for people who are encouraging, welcoming, humble, optimistic, and kind. Um, I met Phil Bagwell 10 years ago at this conference. Um, and he, he was one of the first piece, per, people to welcome me. I, you know, I was in this new country. I was in Switzerland. I'd never been here before. He was one of the first people to welcome me in. Uh, and, you know, you're just talking to him. You have no idea who this person is. He's welcoming you. And you find out, oh, he's the one who invented the uh, data collection behind Vector, right? Like, uh, very, very cool. Very humble guy. Really welcoming. Awesome. I think uh, Martin was going to give us a, a Phil Bagwell story quick. So I, I met Phil uh, some years earlier, I think it was 2007. Uh, he came to my office, uh, just knocked on the door, and says, well, you know, I have this problem. I have this idea for these sort of uh, immutable uh, lists, uh, which are more efficient than hash cons, uh, than const lists. Um, and I, I'm thinking of submitting it to a conference. How do I make sure that the program committee will not steal my idea? I said, well, they're not typically in the business of doing that, but if you're concerned, then uh, the typical thing is you do a tech report and you can do one with my group. So essentially you can publish it as an EPFL tech report, which he did. So I taught him about academic publishing and then he went on and taught me about reaching out to the community because he was really an expert in that. He, his uh, previous job was as a, as a marketing manager for digital equipment at the time. And what he really could do is he could really encourage, mentor, encourage, uh, enthusiast uh, other people. He was absolutely great in that. And he, he lost us far too early. Uh, he couldn't come. He went to the first two, two Scala days. He couldn't come to the third one anymore. So we decided to name this award in his name. <laughs> So uh, in, in addition to just, you know, the, the traits that we saw in Phil that we'd like to encourage, uh, we wanted to look for one of three different uh, criteria in, in candidates. And it could be one or more of these things. Uh, we have this thing we call technical benefaction, which is just people who contribute a lot of technical content to the community. You know, they're, they're doing libraries. They're the unsung heroes of what makes Scala tick. Uh, we want to promote people who evangelize. These are people who go out to the, the external programming world, not just in the Scala microcosm, but, but beyond, and bring people in and make it welcoming for newcomers. Teach this message that Scala is easy to learn and it's a good language and we have good people. Um, activism is building up the community and changing the shape of the community in a healthy way, making this a better community, a community we want to be a part of. So, with that said, um, we have a little bit of a problem with this process because we actually didn't announce a 2018 winner. Um, so you're actually going to get to see two winners this, this, this time. Uh, we're going to have to announce the 2018 winner and a 2019 winner. And so we have two, two winners here, and I think they're both uh, very deserving. Um, so for 2018, uh, we have chosen Kenji Yoshida. I don't... Yeah. Um, we're, we're not sure if Kenji is one person, except I, did, I have met him. Uh, he, he's <laughs> very nice and, and just very outstanding technical contributions throughout the community. Um, ha, has a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of activity. Um, I, I can't remember a project I ever worked on in Scala that didn't have a commit from Kenji. And uh, we have a short little video for him. Uh, Yoshida-san, I just wanted to congratulate you on winning the Phil Bagwell Award uh, this year. Um, you are a phenomenal contributor. I can't actually think of a project that off the top of my head that you haven't contributed to that's important to the community. So, uh, 
So just want to appreciate all your efforts and just uh, your calm, steady voice on uh, technical issues and, and all the work you do for the community. Thank you. Fushida-san, congrats on Phil Bagwell Award. Thanks for your contribution to the Scala ecosystem over the years. Your passion for functional programming and dedication to the Scala ecosystem is really inspirational. I want to thank you especially for the pull requests you've been sending for open source project for SVT or Scala migrations. Thanks again. Hi, Kenji. Uh, you probably don't remember this, but you reviewed the first pull request I ever made. Uh, it was a two-line pull request and it had two typos in it, and it was a complete disaster. Um, <laughs> But your, your, your contributions are so numerous and arrive so rapidly uh, that it's really hard for me to understand how you are uh, just a single person. Uh, it's, it's really just astonishing. Really? Um, so this is really well deserved. Congratulations. Hi there. This is Mar Sabin uh, at Skull Days 2019 here in Lausanne for its uh, 10th anniversary. And um, this is just a little message from me uh, mentioning um, uh, one, uh, Kenji Yoshida, uh, who I have never met in person, but who has been the uh, amazingly prolific uh, author of numerous pull requests directed towards uh, libraries of mine, libraries that I help maintain, uh, and right across the Scala ecosystem. Uh, he's done an incredible service to all of us over the years, and we are all enormously grateful. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to join uh, everybody else welcoming him to the family of uh, Bagwell Awards. Um, and uh, all I can say is uh, congratulations and thank you so much. So uh, Yoshida-san was not able to be here today, but on his behalf, uh, Eugene Yakoda uh, has been communicating with him and has uh, some, some words. Yeah, you can come here, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I haven't gotten the material from Yoshida-san, so I'd just like to thank my mom uh, and, uh, <laughs> and all, all the panels uh, for the, uh, this, this award. I just want to share like, a few stories about uh, Yoshida-san. Yeah. When you meet in person, he's a really shy person, but he's really kind-hearted. And the, uh, I remember like, a few years ago when I went to Skara Matsuri, I normally live in the United States, so I don't know many people in Tokyo. But he just casually like asked me on Twitter or something, and say, "Hey, do you want to go out for dinner and something like that?" And the, uh, you know, he just like met and we talked about different Scala stuff. And so the interesting thing about his background, like speaking of like a diversity, is that he didn't get computer science degree in his college. Uh, his major is actually in the traditional Asian calligraphy. So the his uh, Twitter handle. Uh, he's based in Japan, but his Twitter handle and the GitHub handle, Shui K, right? It's actually uh, like an old Chinese the, uh, Renaissance person who mastered the poetry and drama writing and painting and calligraphy. And he went to a very traditional school that studies this thing. And for him, the uh, programming was basically in a way of sort of like he learned it through on the job. And over the like, evolution of Scala, he's obviously learned, mastered uh, all sorts of the, the, the various aspects of the language spec and the functional programming. So in one of the any Scala, I think the, you know, he wasn't there, but a bunch of functional programmers were kind of like talking over the beer, like, how does he find this bug? Because I'm pretty sure no one has ever come across this particular code path. So I asked him, you know, in over, I don't know, Twitter or in person, like, how, how do you find these kind of things? And his answer was that he used to download the source code of, you know, like Scala Z or the Scala on his iPad, and he literally reads it like a book. Wow. <laughs> and he literally reads it and understands it like a book. Because you know he his his English reading has improved over the course of years, but his mode of communication basically with the English speaking majority of the open source is through code. So he wanted to really really get it right and understand the code. And when he sends a pull request, he wants to be able to basically communicate through that. So that's just like mind blowing. 
way of thinking about it, and the uh, and then yeah, everyone knows like the amount of contribution he's made. Uh, when 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 he was on the paternal leave, I think he made something like thousand like pull requests or something like that over a whole like a year or something. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for this uh, honor, and the, uh, I'll definitely uh, tell him when I see him soon. Thank you. There we go. All right. That was awkward. All right. So, uh, yeah, and now on to 2019. So, uh, we have another winner uh, for 2019, and, and uh, this, one, this one, again, is highly deserving. This winner is Kelly Robinson. Um, So, so Kelly, Kelly is a winner on multiple fronts. Uh, she's, she's one of the founders of Scala Bridge, a, a thing which has been evolving and really changing the shape of our community in a really, really good way. Um, and also, I, I, have, I have a, a picture of the blog here. I would recommend going to that, checking out GitHub repositories. There's lots of really, really good learning material that is designed for newcomers. If you read through and you want to know how to write tutorials for newcomers, this is your example. Um, just, just wonderful, wonderful things. So uh, we have a short little video for you as well. Hey, oh well, Shep. So as long as I've known Kelly, I've known accountable for two things. Fighting sarcasm and doing awesome things for the Scala community. She's probably best known for what she's done with Scala Bridge, founding it and leading some of the very first Scala Bridge events. And I really think Scala Bridge has had a huge impact on the Scala community, introducing people who are traditionally underrepresented in the community to Scala. So congratulations, Kelly. I can't think of a more worthy recipient for the Phil Bagwell Award. Hi, Kelly. Congratulations on the Community Award. Thank you for creating Scala Bridge. Hi, Kelly. Congrats on the Phil Bagwell Award. And thanks for all your contributions to the Scala community, both technical and the activism of making the community inclusive and friendly community for all members really makes me happy as a community member to see how Scala Bridge is happening all around the world. Hi from sunny California, although you can't really see the sun. Kelly, congratulations on the Phil Bagwell Award. Uh, you are an amazing part of the Scala community and always ready to help. Uh, I remember uh, running into you in the United Lounge on our way to another Scala conference and just sitting down with you and being like, hey, what's up? I want to like make this video really quickly of doing a pull request review and you were just totally ready to take your time, which you would have otherwise been relaxing and, and like working on that project. So um, I think you're an amazing choice and congratulations. Kelly, congratulations on behalf of myself and your friends and coworkers and literally everybody that's uh, turned on two-factor authentication after following you on Twitter. I can't think of a better steward, role model, evangelist for the community. We need more people that would never even think of inlining XML in their otherwise perfectly good code, and I know you won't. Um, but seriously, well done. Uh, you've given the investment bankers of the world some real hope, uh, some chance of salvation, something they can cling to, and, and that's not nothing. So I hope you're there feeling proud of yourself, enjoying the day. Um, you're getting off easy, but don't go too hard. Stand up's at 10. Hey, Kelly. Uh, I am up here on the roof. Uh, at Scala Days, and at this very moment, somewhere below me, uh, there is a Scala Bridge happening, and uh, we have you to thank for it. So thank you, and congratulations. Would you like to come up and say anything? Thank you all. I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has TA'd or planned a workshop. Uh, Scholar Bridge would not be possible without you, so thank you. Okay, whoops, can you hear me? Um, so that's, that's it for the Phil Bagwell Awards. Um, if you check the schedule right now, now we, we move into the, the closing panel. Um, normally the closing panel uh, is really informal and it's more for you than it is for us. We're not up here, you know, like saying profound things to, you know, preaching anything. Um, it's really to try and create a little bit of a dialogue between, um, you know, everybody here and uh, the, the folks that you might know from the stage here. Um, so we're going to, before we kind of get into the, the full panel, 
I know that uh, not everybody knows everybody on stage. I think we know who Martin is and Kelly at this point, but uh, I think we should, we're gonna do a quick round of introductions. Um, one thing about the introductions, since, since Bogdan had this really cool uh, app thingy that he did today, uh, I'm going to use it as well. Um, so we're going to do a little round of introductions and I want you to kind of help because the goal is to try and point out who is telling a lie about their history. So everybody on the panel here is going to give you, they're going to introduce themselves, of course. They're going to tell you uh, their name, you know, maybe, you know, what they do, how they, how they, uh, how you might know them from Scala. Uh, and then they're going to give you two facts, or rather two pieces of information, right? One is true, one is false. And so uh, it's going to be quite funny to see, you know, what you think is, is the true or the false one. We're going to do that real quick before we get into the actual panel discussion so we all kind of know who these people are. And I'm glad that everybody is already, like, logged on. Look at this, this is great. Okay, so we're going to start with Eugene. So intro and two things about you, one true, one false. Hi, uh, I'm Eugene. I'm a member of the uh, Light Band Scala team. Um, uh, the... Okay, you can't vote yet. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the maintainer of SVT. So two facts. Uh, one, that is I'm a lacto-vegetarian, so I eat cheese and yogurt, but no meat products. Uh, and the second is that I like uh, German uh, electronic music, uh, like minimal techno, that kind of stuff. All right, which seems more believable, please tell me. Some people know Eugene, so I hope that they're right. <laughs> okay, so it seems like people think that you're into techno and that you're not a lacto-vegetarian. We'll give you like a few more seconds. So what is true? If you see my Twitter feed, I ate kebab after the community party yesterday. Ooh, it's okay. <laughs> and I also make, uh, every three months, I make the mixtape. That's also on my Twitter. Okay. So, yeah. so, story number two is the true one. Yes. You are into minimal electronic music. Cool. Oh, well, yes, thank you. Actually, hey, you didn't introduce yourself, actually. I mean, that was, that was also intended. So, where do you work? What do you do? How do we know you from the Scala community? Tell us. Yes, go ahead. The, the, yeah, basically, I maintain SVT, and the, uh, you may also know Scala XV, which is the XML data binding tool that uh, some people use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's pretty much it, I guess, the, yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. Adrian. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Adrian Mors. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm just um, there. That's like, you can vote on that already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did. I, I lead the Scala team at Lightband. Um, and actually, I don't, I didn't, I didn't get the thing. I thought you were going to come up with Oh, no, stories. you have to come up with two, two, two things. Uh, okay, okay. You can do it. Uh, I can do it. Um, let's see. First, let's do the true thing. Wait, no. <laughs> oh, wait. It's not wait, how this sorry, is supposed to work. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, There's already eight people voted, so I don't even know what's going <laughs> But I'm glad that they chose the first one, because obviously that's supposed to be correct. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> um, Damn, I'm really, I'm really bad at this stuff. See, that's the other all stuff. All right, all right, um, I'll do it. So you like, you like salsa? Oh, I noticed. I have, a, I have another story. Oh, okay. Go I've, ahead. I've had, I've had Starbucks before. Is is one story. Um, <laughs> and uh, the other story is that I invented Haskell. All right, this one's good. I like this one. Oh my God. <laughs> Can I just say thank you for voting for number two? Uh, <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but I have had one cup of espresso from Starbucks before. <laughs> All right, so the, wait, the, wait, so state the truth, to tr to restate it yeah, so people so, hear. No, I, I have in my life had like literally one cup of espresso from Starbucks, and <laughs> I'm, this is like my moment of telling everybody about it because I've been hiding this for a long time. We forgive you. Um, it's okay. And I, I actually, I came to Scala because I couldn't figure out Haskell. So, you know, it's the <laughs> number, number one is, is this true sort. I know a certain professor we, we who claims that Haskell isn't real. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Support yeah. groups tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On to Josh. Oh, uh, yes, I'm Josh. I, uh, I don't have a last name. Um, 
You can say your last name correctly because I'll say it wrong. Uh, it, uh, yeah, so my last name is uh, interesting. It's a, it's a blended mix of uh, German and French because uh, my ancestors apparently were French, maybe, maybe German, not sure. Uh, so, but yeah, it's Surrett uh, with that nice silent H on it. Perfect. Yeah. I've always said it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a book at one point in time. Uh, some people might have read it. Some people might not remember it now. Uh, it's called Scala in Depth, and I did a lot with the Scala community. Um, for my two stories, the first one is, uh, I'm going to take from Adrian, possibly. Um, there are things that people know me for. So, uh, I never wear socks, and I invented my own programming language that is published in an academic journal. All right, let's go. What do you think? Oh my God. <laughs> That's the most believable one, hey. All right. Uh, yeah, should I, should I say? Go for it, yeah. Yeah, so there's a April Fool's Day academic journal, and I made a language called Lambda Doggy that is designed for dogs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, you can find it on Google Scholar, the article. It's a Sigbovic paper, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. All right, on to Martin. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Martin. I'm, uh, I invented Scala. That's, that's a fact. <laughs> is that one of the stories? <laughs> no. That's, so, so the story is, uh, number one, uh, my first programming language was actually Fortran 5. And number two, uh, Scala was first called Scola from school. Like S, wait, how do you spell it? S-C-O-L-A, but then we decided to change the O to the People don't have, have faith in the, in the naming thing, do they? All right, what, what, what's true? So, uh, one is false. My first programming language was Algol 60, Ooh. not Fortran 5. Uh, wow, right. so most people were very <laughs> wrong. And number two is true because uh, Scala was first uh, an acronym for a software composition language, so SCO. But then that sounded too much like school, and most people don't like school, so we changed it to scalable language. <laughs> so that's actually, I, I had no clue. That's amazing. All right. Holden. I'm, I'm Holden. Uh, I work at Google. Uh, or I haven't checked my email today. I probably still work at Google. Um, I work on Apache Spark mostly, and that's probably where, if you know me, you know me from. She wrote a lot of books on Apache Spark that I think most of us read. Yeah, um, I'm very sorry uh, for uh, that whole thing. Yeah, uh, that example repo is bad. Anyways, um, <laughs> okay, so story, story number one is... Um, oh. Whoever did that, thank you. Okay. Uh, my stuffed animal's name is Rainbow. And story number two is that every night I fall asleep with a stuffed animal. That's, this is hard, actually. Yeah, there's got to be one is false on technical. Wait, what, what, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> JavaScript, <That's>... probably. <laughs> Wait, this isn't Scala JS? Well, oh. I don't know. We can ask them, but I don't know. All right. Okay. It would appear that most people know that uh, Rainbow is my wife's stuffed animal. <laughs> uh, and so every night I fall asleep with a stuffed animal. Okay. So you guys were right for this one. Yeah. All right. And last but not least, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. Uh, I started Scala Bridge. Uh, I've also been known to complain about free monads. Um, I, I work at Twilio, which you may know from your lanyards. Uh, story number one is that Elon Musk blocked me on Twitter. Uh, story number two is that Donald Trump blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think most people have voted so. So either one would be an honor, but Donald Trump actually did block me on Twitter.
Congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's my greatest honor. <laughs> Whoop. Whoa, what is this business? Hold on. Uh, yes, we'll start question. No, this is not correct. Oh my God, what are you doing? Nope, nope. All right, so what I had intended to have here was a, a bunch of, um, basically the thing that Bogdan had done earlier where you can suggest a topic to discuss and I must have done it incorrectly. However, um, I, will, I will fix that momentarily. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to start everybody off with a topic that I think that we're all kind of wondering about. Um, so we, we all saw several different talks uh, this week about Scala 3 and what's coming, right? Um, and a lot of them were super cool. And I think there's really this visceral excitement nowadays about, you know, what we see coming. And, you know, there's a roadmap and everything seems like it's really, you know, on its way, right? Um, so what I, you know, the, 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 the issue that I guess I wanted to, to sort of, you know, pass to the panel is a question of, you know, what, what next for the community? And the community is everybody, right? So the community is you know, library authors, the community is corporate users, the community, so what should these folks be doing? How should people be preparing? Obviously educational um, resources, what should change, right? So I know, you know, we have these changes with implicits, right? So perhaps we should change how we approach this when, I mean, obviously we're not teaching beginners implicits, however, at some point people discover them, right? And so we have to change how we explain these things to people completely, right? Um, so I have, I have a range of kind of questions and, I, and you know, everybody on stage here um, is a big part of basically every corner of our, of our ecosystem, right? Build tools, compiler lead, Martin designing Scala 3, Josh has basically been writing a whole bunch of books for Scala for years and helping people all over the internet. Holden uh, works with Spark, right? And we all know that Spark upgrades slowly sometimes, sorry. Um, and Kelly, um, well, aside from making fun of free monads, I mean, you have a lot of experience bringing, uh, you know, newcomers on teams and whatnot up to speed to be able to contribute to, you know, an, an you know, actively moving team in, 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 in industry, right? So you all have, you know, interesting perspectives here. Um, and of course, Martin, you know, could comment on his view for how we see, how, how we should change how we educate people, right? Um, but I wanted to, so we have all these viewpoints and we can actually discuss a few of them and I wanted to start um, actually on the education point, because I think that that requires longer term thinking, maybe, um, how, you know, we're gonna have to change a lot of things, right? Or, or not. So maybe Martin, you wanna, you, do you have any thoughts about, you know, how, how do we, how do we change, uh, you know, the educational materials that we have, or how should we change our approach? Do we, or no? Uh, the microphone, you have, oh. so, so yes, yes, I do think that, uh, Essentially, we have to revise. So it, for, for me, it will be basically the, the moment where I have to revise my Scala courses. Uh, uh, one thing that, well, there, there's trivial things like we drop new. Uh, there are more elaborate things like uh, introduce enums early because they are a simpler path towards data. Uh, uh, and there are more advanced things like when you come to implicits, uh, then we have to change it to delegates and hopefully do better than last time. In fact, uh, at least in my, t my teaching, I found that uh, the teaching of impl implicits always was very disorganized and ad hoc and afterthought. We never really properly taught them, maybe because we didn't really have the good concepts to teach them. So that all that will, will have to change and I'll, I'll revise the MOOCs, I'll revise first the in-class courses. Once I have done that for a year, we'll, we'll hopefully do, do the MOOC again. Uh, we'll have to get uh, books, uh, teaching materials, tutorials, everything. So it, it will be essentially a big, a big revision. And this is, I mean, I actually kind of, you know, this is beyond, I guess, Martin. I, I start with Martin, right? But I mean, uh, onboarding new employees. I mean, does this does this seem like something that we're going to have to alter, or, or do 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 people believe that most of the changes that are coming are not really targeted at the people who would be, I don't know, uh, in an onboarding uh, course or something at a, at a large company? Well, I have the impression that anyway. I mean, things are very much in flux, like the. The libraries that people would use uh, today is, are probably quite different from the libraries people used three years ago. So uh, I think for onboarding people, you sort of have to sort of upgrade continuously anyway. So I don't think that will be a, a bigger change than, than many others that, that, uh, that arise during time. Anybody else? Kelly, perhaps? Or I mean, we'll have to look at rewriting the curriculum. Noel, you up for that? 
so for but does Scalab I mean so this would be the Scala Bridge curriculum I, I suppose right. right yeah so one of the one of the things that you have to think about with that kind of stuff is when you're writing tutorials for people what we've thought about with Scala Bridge is we want people to have a setup that they can then take to uh, continue on with. Uh, courses like this are, in any kind of educational course that you're starting someone out with, you want to be able to empower them to continue learning on their own. Uh, uh, Scala Bridge is usually a one-day workshop, and so there's only so much that you can get through in one day, and so I, I'm hesitant to upgrade Scala Bridge to Scala 3 until it's at a point where the people that would be using that would also be using Scala 3 in the rest of their projects in their everyday life. Uh, so I had a comment um, uh, about that. What, what I find interesting about Dottie and what, what's coming in Scala 3 is there, there's a core Scala language that actually directly translates between the two, right? And there are some things that have changed, like implicits. Um, but I don't think that core language changes. And what I think is interesting, and I, I've been thinking about this with the, the book that I wrote um, and, and how I present concepts, is I think you can present that core language and teach people about that, and it's powerful in itself. And then you can layer on some of these advanced concepts. And I think there's a reshaping that's gonna happen in the community. Um, if we look at library transitions, right? Libraries are going to want to cross compile between Scala 3 and Scala 2.14. So they'll probably use the common subset between the two initially and start to migrate, right? Um, that's just a natural thing that will happen. But I think our teaching might also wanna to, to follow that same pattern. Um, just, and, and uh, from a logical progression of teaching people things, I think it makes sense. Um. Yeah, I mean, my hope would be that it wouldn't be a big deal to introduce Scala 3 to people, and I think for newcomers, if you uh, have a situation where they could use it on either language compiler or either version compiler, that would obviously be ideal. Yeah. So the next um, question or direction that I had hoped to, to address, um, I, thank you everybody, by the way. I, I appreciate this because I feel like we don't, uh, we like to talk about uh, migration and other things like this before we like to talk about how we're going to present this to people who are, who are just, you know, happening upon Scala, right? So it's nice to, to perhaps start with, with, you know, how do we, how do we navigate newcomers, right? Um, sort of the next question that, that uh, I wanted to hear from, from folks on the panel was um, basically uh, the question of, you know, what, what can the community do to, to ready for this transition? So I know between Adrian and Martin and the folks at EPFL and the folks that uh, you know, are touching the, the new stuff at uh, the new Dottie um, you know, developments at Lightbend, um, you know, they have synchronized on various plans for you know, how to consider transitioning, but what about everybody else? Um, should people be attempting to target some of the RCs that are coming out and uh, you know, release libraries against them? Is that a good idea? Or you know, what, what, what is the way forward for everybody, for everybody who is ex excited about this change? They want to get started helping now, but what should they do? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Adrian. Eat your vegetables and heed your deprecation warnings. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I agree, actually. I think cross-building is going to be, you know, important. And we're, of course, looking with 2.14 how to smooth the migration path. And that's what, the conversation that we're going to start after Scala Days with the 2.14 roadmap is what are some of the features that make sense to backport? Of course, a lot of the advanced stuff that can't happen because it requires a fundamentally new compiler. Um, but things like top level definitions or you know, maybe enums um, and, and other things like that, I think would make a lot of sense in 2.14 to enlarge the subset, the common shared subset between 2.14 and 3.0 even more. Um, it's always appreciated to build against milestones and RCs and let us know how it goes. We, we try to do that proactively with the community build, but we can't build everything. And so, you know, whatever project you have, trying it out on, on milestones and RCs is, and, and letting us know how it goes is, is always really appreciated. But not necessarily like releasing for public consumption or just to see if, I guess like, you know, should we be trying to, you know, yeah. build stuff and, and, and release yeah, things or? Course, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if, if it's a library, it should be fully cross-version so that it's clear that it's built against a milestone or, or an RC. Um, but I guess then the question would be, I guess what I'm asking is like transitive dependencies and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, you need a, a dotty whatever version of something compiled to, you know, 
So there's a little bit of bootstrapping in the community, and should we do that? Is that like, is it well, ready? I think yes and no. I mean, like as we, as you know, both Martin and Lucas's talk have 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 explained is that you know the newer compiler can can compile against the older, uh, like against jars produced by the older compilers. Um, that's already the case now for Dottie and Scala 212, and will continue to be the case for uh, Scala 3 and and, and 214. Um, and so the way I see it is that the ecosystem will, bo will bootstrap that way because there will be a 214 ecosystem and the 30 ecosystem can consume the parts that haven't made the jump yet. Um, so I don't know if that, if that answers your question. It does. <laughs> Good answer. Yes, I mean, no, <laughs> this, it's perfect. Um, I presume Martin probably has some opinions. Also, oh my God, uh, the build tool. So Please, so, Eugene, and after Martin. Okay. So, so I think the, the natural thing to happen would be that for the, like the next year or so when we are in 330 milestones, uh, typically you would see new libraries or new versions of existing libraries which have just like, like the base color 3 language not yet the same assumption of stability. So essentially you would hopefully see lots of experimentations and uh, essentially new versions of libraries coming out. We see that already with like Shapeless, uh, Shapeless being completely redesigned for Scala 3. And uh, I would imagine that it, it would also be an opportunity for type class heavy libraries to actually have versions where they can play with the new features and just see, see how it goes without having the assumption that this is already cast in stone. And I guess by the time we are ready to, trip, uh, to ship 3.0 final, that, uh, that then would sort of be a, a parallel movement in the libraries and then indeed uh, cross-building becomes also a big issue, yeah. But I, I believe library, the ecosystem, library ecosystem will start with sort of fresh experiments. Right, but I think Shapeless is a good example because Shapeless 3 will, you know, be available for 2.14 and 3.0. Like it's definitely one of the stated goals as far as I know so far. Maybe, have you changed your mile, mind, Miles? Where are you? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Can we uh, project the screen? I just changed the, the platform for, for folks to ask questions on. Um, so uh, I had intended to use the other one, but it didn't work. So um, I'm gonna go around at to Jean's turn next. We're gonna continue on this question, but um, I'd like you, if you have questions that you would like to have addressed here, um, by specific question, specific person, please feel free uh, to, to, to drop your question in Slido. Eugene. Yeah, so the, it's not particularly from the build tools perspective, but the, uh, if you haven't uh, checked out uh, Lucas's talk, uh, that was really good. Like I learned a lot just, just watching his talk about the, uh, this exact topic of two to three transition. So I, everyone, like I recommend that. And the one, one of the major thing is that the, a lot of the stuff would continue to work. Basically it's the three, is two plus one. And things like implicit is kept there basically as a compatibility mode. So a lot of the stuff would continue to work. I think the, I think the major thing that would change is probably around uh, the meta programming like area, right? So the macro and the, the new style of the meta programming I think will be the, the different parts. So my comment there is the, in the new, world of the ecosystem, there will be more libraries. And I think as a community, especially people who's sitting here, like many representing different uh, library authors to have like empathy towards essentially like a future generation of the Scala new users so that the, uh, we're not just constantly pushing the boundaries, but the think about like what the, you know, being friendly to the new users on learning this new paradigm and more towards like you know being friendly to the new scientist or the data scientist to use these features and essentially like kind of like use the opinionated Scala 3 as a template and follow along that as a guideline uh, instead of doing like a weirder things basically. Cool, thank you. Is there anybody else who, before we, we transition to the next question, um, does anybody want to, to weigh in on sort of like what you think, you know, we as the community basically outside of everybody else, right? What folks should, should, should try to do to help? I mean, we have actually a lot of, I don't know, this is a lot more, at least for me, it feels like a lot more certainty about, you know, being able to go ahead and move forward and try things. And uh, 
it seems great. Uh, but if there's any other thoughts, opinions, no? Yes? I mean, I would like people to try and get Spark building against uh, Scala 3. Um, and ideally, if you can get a building, it doesn't have to work. Um, but like, if anyone has like a lot of free time and really like shell scripts, um, I would love to see someone uh, set up a CI for, for Spark against Scala 3. Um, and, and I think this would also be true for other libraries maybe like that are important, like setting it a, a CI up um, in conjunction with the people that work on the project otherwise so that they're aware of when they're making breaking changes. Uh, so, you know, we hopefully uh, don't accidentally dig us ourselves a hole to fall into. Um, I don't know. I'm lazy, though, so someone else is going to have to do that. So, so I just want to make one point about the Spark thing. Uh, Spark, th uh, Spark doesn't build on Scala 3 yet. Uh, it would be great if it did. But you can use Spark from Scala 3 today. And in fact, we do that in our, in our class. So we had a first uh, class of students uh, this year who used Spark from Scala 3. So it, it means if you're a Spark user, you're not prevented from, from using 3. Right. And Renault told us that they don't use macros. So. Um, shouldn't be too hard to upgrade. Yeah, we generate. Good job. Generate don't don't use macros if you want to upgrade. <laughs> so actually, that was. I mean, so we automatically transit. Thanks, Holden. Actually, that was great because. I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in further to this question, but like we, you guys effectively just answered this. Um, so um, I, I'd, I'd really like to talk about the Trump question. Yeah. I, so like my plan. My plan me. is like this is clearly the most you know pressing question of this panel. Um, I figured that us? we should save the best for last, okay, though. Yeah, yeah. So we are definitely asking Kelly this question, but we're going to wait until the end, if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> um, another very popular question, though, is, uh, you know, so this is probably for maybe Jorge or um, Olaf, if they're here. But uh, if anybody on stage knows anything about uh, what... Support for JDK 11 and Bloop and Metals. I'm really excited that people are so excited by Bloop and Metals, first of all. I'm, I'm really thrilled yeah, to see work. the developments uh, from you guys in the last year or two. It's amazing. Um, but uh, I don't know, Jorge, um, Olaf, if you're here, will you stand up and yell what's going to happen? They're so, busy working on this guy. On are, the you Java are you kidding? Are you guys, they're not here? <laughs> what is this? All right. Well, we can ask them on the internet, I guess. That's a pity. So the, at least at the Zinc level, uh, Zinc 1.3, that's currently in the basically the uh, RC series to, right now together with SVT. 1.3 is the first series that we're doing the integration testing fully on the Adopt Open JDK, JDK 11. So uh, we've made some few changes in there, so hopefully that will, you know, bloop and metals will follow quickly uh, along once the, you know, Zinc 1.3 becomes basically uh, available, hopefully, so. I heard very quietly somebody saying bloop is out with JDK 11? That's Olaf? I can't hear you. I mean, I can't see you, so. Actually, that's amazing. So we, we have the answer. Thank you, Olaf. Um, next question, actually, this is, I think, one that people have been wondering, um, and it's for Martin, of course. What are your thoughts on eventually putting, like, I don't know, a richer version of dependent types in the Scala? Adrian, look away. <laughs> Just looking into the light. Yeah, look at the light instead, it's better. W not, uh, it, it seems that would not happen in the three uh, Dotic series. I think that's, that's further out. Uh, uh, I believe that the state of the art right now is that dependent types are possible for the very courageous. Uh, Scala has a version of dependent types, which is not quite as powerful as some of the other systems that you see in, in some of the more advanced languages out there. But I believe on that front, we will stay pretty much on what we have for a while. I think the next big thing to happen before dependent types is really effects. So uh, I, be, I expect something to happen on the effect side, and once that is done, then dependent types would be the next one after. But we're re really talking in terms of very, very long periods. Like sure. On the, on the effects question, so, um, I mean, of course, I, I'm familiar with a previous proposal, um, the effects with, you know, by implicits. Um, 
maybe, I mean, because I'm not sure, you know, I've heard you talk about research before and I've heard you present these ideas to a bunch of, a bunch of researchers, but I don't think anybody or very few people probably here have any clue what that even means. So could you give like two sentence Quick intro to what that what that is. So, so what again? This is this is not not a release plan. This is research. That means we're going to try out things, and we might be wrong. In which case, nothing will materialize. But the the idea is to say instead of talking about effects, we talk about capabilities. Uh, so instead of saying throwing an exception, we say we talk about the capability to throw an exception. And we will model capabilities with a form of implicit parameters. That's, that's the gist of it. And the uh, advantage is that if we capture abstract over implicit parameters with implicit function types, then we get very nice um, properties, algebraic properties of commutativity and subsetting that which should really essentially make using uh, expressing effects much smoother than they were before. That's the hope, but we have to do it and uh, try it out and uh, then see whether we were right or wrong. So then that would mean like practically you'd, you know, you'd like implement a method which has a handful of these capabilities, right? Like it has the capability to throw, it has the capability to IO or something, capability to throw an exception, uh, and things like that, right? Right, and, and the, the, uh, the trick is to say can throw and can do IO is the same thing as can do IO and can throw, whereas if you encode these things with type constructors, that's not true. You have to sort of work very hard to, to, to swap the two constructors. The other advantage is that you can get these uh, capabilities over an arbitrary large scope, so you do not have to go into each and every computation and essentially uh, keep your constructors around and go into all the problems of uh, essentially monads, free monads, finally tagless, uh, these things that are in the end all deal with this question that essentially you have a lot of type constructors in the way and you have to deal with them one way or another. Adrian, you picked up the mic, change your mind? Uh, no, I mean, I, I was thinking more about like taking a step back and thinking you know, about what is the type system for and you know, what, what do we want it to do for you and you know I think of the type system as you know like the friend who like gently nudges you away from like cliffs and stuff and um, also doesn't stand in your way when you want to do like mildly amusing stuff that could be dangerous but actually you know productive um, and so I think you know dependent types are cool um, there might be ways to to you know when you have like fuller dependency to to, to reason about you know that that term language that now is at your type at your type system, but I think there's a real chance that it just becomes too complicated and like bang for buck factor goes down too much. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I really like about Scala is that the type system has found a good balance between just keeping you from shooting yourself in the foot, but still letting you you know do stuff. It's expresso. Some people are laughing. I don't know. <laughs> You're laughing in favor, right? Okay, I have another. Uh, so wow, one keeps there's one keep popping on all the way up can here. You, can you actually like scroll a little bit? Cause yeah, like, those, I, those like trolley things kind of like. I can't hide the, the trolley. I was things. really tired. I'm sorry to hide. I can't hide it. It's, so people don't troll him. Um, no. I was really tired. <laughs> I, there's like four of these. I just keep seeing these espresso ones. Please. <laughs> okay, the real question. Uh, this one really just keeps getting a bunch of votes. Why are case classes not final in Scala three? I like uh, <laughs> basically, they're enums. So if you want uh, final case classes, use an enum. It's a simpler way as well. And uh, the trend in enums, enum cases are final. So that's the answer. So we didn't feel that it was worthwhile to essentially introduce a new restriction that would break existing code, including my code. I, I use case classes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great answer, actually. <laughs> so, so why do I use case classes which are not final? It's essentially because I want um, uh, I want to do pattern in the compiler in the type structure. I want to have the ability to pattern match on a certain class of things, and then have subclasses. So it, they have to be a case class, and then have subclasses of them for implementation-specific region uh, reasons, which nevertheless all essentially have the same pattern matching behavior. So that's why I use the feature that case classes can, in fact, have subclasses. Okay. So this is going to be the last question before we answer the infamous 
Trump block, you, I mean, that was a great, great story, Kelly. I can't wait to hear more. Um, we have one more question before we, we get to that, that juicy story. Um, I think, I mean, this one's pretty cool. Uh, you know, when I, back when I started um, in like 2011 or 10 or something, um, you know, it was, the JBM was funny, right? Because, you know, or rather the JDK was hilariously slow and then all of a sudden, of course, we all know in the last several years, uh, development has really sped up and it's been really exciting to watch. Um, and, you know, you guys have kept up with, uh, you know, like, uh, um, like functions and all these other things being added to the JBM, or I'm sorry, to the JDK. Um, you know, we've watched Scala kind of follow suit, right? Um, and, and, you know, update with, uh, with the JBM, but uh, updates to the JDK and JVM. Um, so the question is really, you know, what, what next? There's all these other cool, fancy things being added. Are we going to see some of these things changing how Scala bytecode is emitted? Are we going to be reusing these things from the JVM? We're going to use our own? This is a question for probably, I mean, I guess it's mostly Martin and Adrian. What do you think? Or you haven't thought about it yet, or? <sighs> like, yeah, oh, I, was, no. I, was, I was just reading through like the other questions and you know, like, asking about. How do about... I get away from this one? <laughs> no, not at all. I, I don't know. I think um, Java 8 is a great platform. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't want this, but so wait, the, the moral of the story is let's keep this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, there's a few things that are cool in Java 11 and there's more coming. Uh, I think we need a probably a more compelling set of features before we would bump the required version of, of Java again. I think more so than anything, that was probably one of the bigger things that, that, that helped back Spark, uh, Spark's upgrade because along with you know the, Spark, the, Java, the Scala ecosystem, they had to upgrade their Java ecosystem as well. Um, so we don't, we don't like upgrade to the required Java version lightly. Like you can like, you know, make use of Java 11 features um, in, in Scala 2.13 and so on. Um, but I don't know, I don't, I don't currently don't see like a killer feature yet. I mean, if Loom lands then yes, for sure. But until that happens, I don't really see too much that I'm very excited about. I mean, like I'm mildly excited about a lot of things, but like not like make you guys upgrade your Java's mm -hmm. excited levels. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the main reasons why, why we want Tasty, uh, because with Tasty we can actually cross-build towards several Java versions, so that means we would, we would be independent of that. Right now, it's not practical. You have to, essentially the version mat matrix that would uh, drive you crazy if you say Java 2.14 for Java 6 uh, uh, and, and, and so on, the, the whole matrix. But with Tasty, you can actually decouple, so you can convert an n times m problem to an n plus m problem, which is much simpler. Hey, cool. Um, so I think that uh, we're finally on to the to the, the question of the evening. Kelly, can you you're, tell you're, us more? You're all going to be very disappointed because the answer is I don't know. It was October of 2015. If you want to look at my tweets from then, I feel a little weird about telling you to do that, but you, you tell me, right? Uh, I'm actually going to hijack the stage, though, and talk about another question I saw getting votes, Perfect. which was, how do we do, deal with trolls in the Scala community? Uh, I didn't see that one. That's amazing. Stop. If I saw that one, I would have... Stop being assholes. Be kind to each other. It's actually lucrative to be kind to each other, and I don't know what motivates you, but you can probably make more money if you're just a nice person. That's my two cents. Amen. Thank you. All right, um, so with that, I mean, there's a million, actually, I, really cool questions. I'm sorry that this came up so, so late, uh, like the ability to add your own, because uh, we didn't get to some of them, so um, sorry. But uh, thanks for asking questions, and of course, thanks, for, um, thanks to all of the, the panelists that have uh, come up here and, and uh, told fun facts about themselves, as well as all kinds of juicy, interesting facts that we would like to, to know about, you know, mostly upcoming Scala 3, so let's thank the panel. Um, and and that, that about wraps it up for, for Scala Days. There's one very important event um, after, after this, and that is the farewell cocktail, which will go until 8 p.m. in the lobby here. So you can hang out and, and chat, and uh, there might be snacks, and there's definitely drinks. Um, 
you know, and have a good time uh, before before we all part ways. Um, there's a couple of other announcements and details. So tomorrow is the type level summit. Um, it is not in this building in case you are planning to attend. It is on the EPFL campus in the CO building. Um, if you have no idea where that is, it's best to just double check. I just want to make sure you all know that, you know, people that are in this room do not come back here. Um, look online for the directions. It's on, it's on the campus. It's across the street. Uh, the building is called CO, but you'll figure it out if you check the website. Um, everything starts at 9 a.m. Oh, Lars has informed me that there will be stickers on the floor, so you don't have to try that hard. Just do not come to this building, okay? Um, the next thing is that uh, there is a uh, scholar user group uh, organizers dinner. Um, so folks who have organized meetups and conferences and other things like this, um, there's a little thank you dinner for, for those folks. Um, there is a limited capacity, and it's not exactly like, you know, an invite-only thing. Um, you can come and, and join if you'd like, but like I said, we at some point will reach capacity, so we will not be able to bring everybody. Uh, sponsored by Tegenal. Sorry, I was unaware of this detail, so thank you. Um, and the, if, you, if you plan on going to that, uh, just meet here in the lobby, I think at 6.45 or 7, uh, there will be an announcement. So you'll find us kind of standing over by the, the information desk and people will walk over uh, from here. Um, and I, I believe those are all the, the remaining organizational details. Is, that, is there anything else that I've missed? Okay. So first, now, now that we're done with all the organizational details, um, I, I'd like to, uh, everybody, while I have your attention, Please, like, let's stand up and thank the organizers for doing such a wonderful job of putting this together. So, this is a lot of people. It's not, it's not just one person, but of course, it's Daria Jovanovic, Diana Gunter, um, and countless other folks from um, various companies, including Lightbends, EPFL, Lausanne Tourism, uh, and we've had several wonderful volunteers. So. Um, Thank you to all of you. Uh, it was really an incredible Scala Days. I really felt a difference in sort of the community aspect of it. It was really, really exciting, so thank you. Um, we'd also like to thank the sponsors, of course, because we wouldn't have all of these cool uh, social activities unless they, they came and participated with us, so let's thank the sponsors as well. And finally, thank the speakers and everybody who came. So thank you, everybody, for making this a cool event, like everybody here. So thank you, and until next year, and I hope you enjoy the drinks. Scala, you know.